Hello, my name is Michael Green, and I welcome you to the 12th episode of my podcast, Historians in Conversation, which is hosted by the University of Lodz in Poland. My guest today is Professor Martin Gutmann from Lucerne University of Applied Sciences and Arts. And Professor Gutmann has a very interesting career path because he is not only a historian, but he's an historian who is working at a, a business department. So in my conversation today, I will be focusing on discussing with uh, Martin about his motivation to study history, but also about his very interesting career path. I welcome Martin to my podcast. Martin, welcome to my podcast. I'm very happy that you agreed to take part in it. Thank you, Mikhail. It's a pleasure to be on. Thank you. Well, traditionally, it's already our 12th episode. I start with asking my guests about their childhood and their in the development of their interest in history. So I would like to ask you about your own background. Could you tell a little bit about your family, about your parents, siblings, where were you born? And uh, how did your childhood uh, look? Sure. Um, I was born in Sweden, in southern Sweden, uh, in a place called Vellinge, which is a small town just south of Malmö. And today there is a bridge that connects Malmö to Copenhagen, Denmark. When I was a child, that was not the case, but I still felt um, the influence of you know, Denmark. We watched a lot of Danish TV in southern Sweden. The dialect you speak there is... Uh, it's still Swedish, but uh, to people from northern Sweden, it does sound a bit uh, a bit odd. So I had the Swedish uh, childhood with the Danish influence. And my dad is, my mother is Swedish. My dad is Swiss. And so we also spoke Swiss German at home. And so when, you were growing up bilingual, in fact. Yes, exactly. Uh, I don't quite remember this, but my parents uh, have mentioned that I wasn't too keen to speak German as a child because I I was the only one who was growing up bilingually and, you know, I wanted to be like all the other children. They were only speaking Swedish. So apparently, uh, so my parents tell me I only spoke Swedish, but I, of course, understood uh, the German, the Swiss German that my my dad was speaking. And uh, when I was 10, we moved as a family to Tokyo, Japan. And I spent a little under four years there, which was uh, a great experience. It was tough at first, but uh, I have very fond memories of that time. And then we moved to the US when I was uh, 13 and uh, then did the rest of my schooling there, college, etc and came back to Europe uh, as an adult. What were your parents doing? Why were you moving so much? My dad worked for a Swiss company that made or still makes food processing um, machines, you know, mills and these types of, um, of machines and systems. And uh, he had worked for them from the beginning. So he did an apprenticeship with them right after his schooling and stayed with them for many, many years. And um, he worked for them in Sweden, the Swiss company, and then had the opportunity to head up their uh, Tokyo office. And that's why we moved to Tokyo. And your mother? My mother uh, worked when we lived in Sweden, but when we then moved to Japan, she uh, cared more. I have an, an older brother as well, so she then uh, took care of us. I think there was there were a lot of things to get adjusted to as a family, so that's what she did. And when we moved to the U.S., uh, she also stayed at home. She did a lot of volunteering, uh, especially in you know in the U.S., especially in Minneapolis where we lived. There are a lot of uh, you know Swedish associations because they're strong, or there was a, a strong record of of Swedish. Um, migration to uh, Minnesota, to the Midwest U.S. So she was very, very much involved and still is in such Swedish uh, associations there. 
How was it to, to move from one school to another, from one school system to another school system? Especially was, when you were not growing up as an English speaker, but as a Swedish and German, then you end up in Japan and then in the States. Yeah, it was, I think looking back, it was a very rich experience, definitely formative for me. It was challenging or, or temporarily challenging in, in the first, you know, three to six months to get adjusted. Um, when we moved to Japan, I first went to um, a German school. And then it, um, I, I'd have to ask my parents here, I don't remember the, the details exactly, but I think um, they figured that we would be more likely to move to um, the US or at least kind of not a German speaking country after Japan. And it therefore made more sense that I go to school in English. So I switched to the international school there in Tokyo uh, after one year at the German school. And having grown up in Sweden, I, I had never had English as a subject in school that would have started, I think, in fourth grade. Now I think they start earlier. But, uh, you know, from, from watching TV and, and these things aren't necessarily always translated or dubbed into Swedish in Sweden. And so I, my English was okay actually just just kind of from from TV and and traveling and reading comics uh, but I still had had a lot to learn in those first few uh, first few months but you know kids kids pick up languages pretty quickly I noticed that with my own kids now so uh, it was okay I won't say that in Denmark at least they do translate even Swedish uh, sometimes into Danish so it's interesting that in Sweden it's not working the same way well, I, I don't know if that's true anymore today. It could be that they that they dub more. Um, and certainly we had some cartoons in Swedish, but I, I just remember being exposed to English quite a bit as as a Swede. Um, and then you you asked about, you know, what it's like to to, to move around and, and speak these different languages as a as a child. I remember quite vividly being uh, slightly uh, confused or had a bit of a humorous situation when we first moved to the U.S. because um, as I started school there, I think I started seventh grade when we moved to the U.S. And I had a bit of an accent. I, I don't now. I got rid of that in, in the U.S. But at the time, you could, you could tell that there was some, some Swedish or some, some Scandinavian uh, intonations. And so, of course, all my new friends there asked, you know, where are you from? And I said, you know, I'm, I'm half Swedish, half Swiss. And a very typical reaction among these new uh, kids I met in at, at this U.S. junior high school was they would say, oh, my God, I'm Swedish, too. Or, oh, I'm half Danish. And um, this, this, this perplexed me because then I tried to speak Swedish with them. And, of course, they didn't speak a word of Swedish. And um, I, this was my first encounter with this um, American phenomenon that people still... Uh, at least, at least superficially, identify very strongly with where their immigrant forefathers came from, even if that was six generations back, and they don't, you know, have never been to Sweden or wherever, don't speak a word. It's still uh, a part of how they introduce themselves and see themselves. And it took me a couple of days because I went home and told my mom, "Oh, there's a bunch of Swedes at school," and she said that they're, you know, they're not Swedish the way you are dear something like that so i figured it out after a while but i was a bit confused at first you're not swedish uh, the way they are that's <laughs> i think it was a very nice way of putting it i don't know if that's exactly what she said but something something to that extent and um you know i don't mean to belittle that i think identity is a very both very personal and a very very strong thing and um it was just a matter of um me being confused by confused by that this so and um, among all of those moves from one place to another schools friends family how did your interest in history arise was it at that point that you were already interested in it or not yet looking back I was always interested in stories, whether, whether they were historical in nature or more contemporary, kind of 
you know, stories about about individuals or or humans and groups who faced various challenges. That's always something that interested me. I, I loved reading as a kid and and still do. Um, however, I never as a as a child said I'd like to be a historian. I don't think I was really aware of that being a profession uh, the way I am the way I am now. Um, I became a historian more by a process of elimination. I went to uh, a small liberal arts college in Colorado after high school. And, you know, I, I, I'm a big fan. We can talk about Slater as well, but I'm a big fan of the liberal arts model where you're really introduced to a whole range of subjects and, and um, you know, the emphasis is more on training, critical thinking, the ability to continually learn than uh, teaching a specific canon from, from one discipline. And after two years at uh, the Colorado College, this small school in Colorado Springs, you know, the, the administration started putting pressure on me and everybody else to pick a major because you have to do that at a certain point. And I went back and looked at what types of, of classes I'd taken. And uh, it turned out I'd, take, I, I'd taken a pretty broad spectrum of classes, but nonetheless, the the uh, the bulk were in in history or political science or sociology. So uh, then I figured, well, I guess I better I better major in in one of these. And then it turned out to be uh, history and political science. And even then, you know, that wasn't really a career path to me. It was still quite open what I wanted to do. I spent a few years after college teaching, teaching history. I really enjoyed it. And, um, you know, then began exploring, you know, is this something one can study further? What does that look like? What do the jobs look like? Um, if, if I were to get a master's uh, and or a PhD in history. So um, I think I was always interested in history, but this idea of becoming a historian uh, is one that I realized only very late. Perhaps that's this moment when you realize that uh, you are facing half Swedes, half Danes in uh, Minnesota. Was the point where you actually start thinking about history as something more? Because you mentioned it, and I made an accent on that uh, phrase of yours. And it seems to me that it's something that uh, immediately had some influence on the way that you were thinking, because you, you said. Well, your mother's remark that they were not sweet in the same way that you were. And perhaps, perhaps it, it could have been the moment that you could have started reflecting on the past. How how is it that they are not the same kind of sweets as you are? Well, just a thought that they came up uh, from our conversation. But uh, the choice of a liberal arts college, was it a choice that uh, was conscious by your parents or by yourself? Or it's something that it was just there and you went to the nearest school because, uh, well, I, for example, did it. I went to the nearest school. Um, no, so Colorado is uh, quite a ways away from, from Minnesota. And uh, so it was definitely not the nearest school. And I did look at a few, you know, larger state universities um, and uh, a couple of different liberal arts schools. I don't know in the end, how um, how I ended up making that choice. I, I, I do know that I, when, I, when I visited Colorado College, I liked how small it was. I liked, it has the block plan. It's one of, I think, two or three universities in the US that have a block plan where you take one class at a time every day, uh, three hours a day, and uh, for three and a half weeks. And when that block is over, you move on to the next class um, in contrast to the traditional semester structure where uh, you know you're enrolled in three or four or five classes that meet once or twice a week uh, and it's all kind of mishmashed so here you're doing one thing uh, very um, intensively for uh, a three and a half week period and so i sat in on some of these some of these classes and i liked how how small the groups were, how um, it, it became clear to me that the professors had a very open and, and close relationship to the students. There was a lot of discussion. 
and uh, so it just seemed like uh, a good fit for me and and it was i had a had a really nice experience there i think an interesting experience but then you mentioned that uh, you were checking various career options, having finished uh, already a bachelor's degree in uh, history, political science and history, as I see written on your CV. So why did you decide on this uh, potential career path into history and not on, for example, political science, which probably could have been offering more job opportunities than history? Yeah, that's that's true. I was... Um... I think I was blissfully naive of the challenges in getting an academic job uh, at the time. And, and you know, this was pre-financial crisis 2008. So there were more jobs available that not when I graduated with my PhD, but at the time when I was making these decisions, that is. So I, I think I kind of assumed whether I get a, a PhD in political science or history, I'll be able to find a job. And um, I think, again, history just kind of, it wasn't so deliberate and more a process of elimination. I did look at a few uh, master's and PhD programs in political science as well. Uh, and in the end, I actually made the choice to go to Syracuse um, for, I think, two things really appealed to me about the program there. The one is that... Um, I met my my future advisor, Michael Ebner, and uh, during a campus visit, and just really liked the guy and felt like I would love to learn from him. And um, again, that's that's a decision I didn't regret. I had a very nice experience there, and and he was a big part of that. And the other thing that appealed to me about Syracuse is that the history department there is a part of the. Maxwell School, the Maxwell School of, of Citizenship and Public Affairs. So it's, um, you know, it's a, it's a graduate school in which the, I think there's 10 or 11 PhD programs are very intermeshed in the sense that even in this, in a PhD program in history there, you do end up taking a lot of courses in political science, in sociology and economics, if you'd like. Um, and you're also exposed to you know the scholars both phd students and the professors in these other fields uh so it's not the same as a, a liberal arts bachelor but nonetheless it it um there was a bit more of dialogue between the disciplines there than i felt was true at other other departments other universities that i visited i'm thinking about my own phd program and master's program so master's program i had to take a few courses from our faculty and i think i had a, an option to take about two or three courses from different uh, faculties but i never really used that opportunity and for my phd in the netherlands i didn't have any courses that i had to take so in many european universities you don't really have any courses there were some instructional and methodological courses that we had to take but it was on a very basic level and nothing about content. It was more about how to write the PhD, how to approach uh, certain things, but not about uh, content. And I think this is a great difference between the American and the European uh, systems. I, I think you're right. That is a, a difference, one that surprised me when I moved to Europe and you know, also became associated with graduate programs here that um, there are either none or or very few courses that PhD students have to take. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I, I can only speak for myself. I think the, the coursework I did as a graduate student um, were and are in some ways foundational for my teaching and also my, my research uh, because they, you know, for, force you to force you to learn about fields of history that are not directly relevant to my own research and interests, but nonetheless um, kind of broaden your perspective, different methodologies, different kind of topics that that dominate um, the historiography of of other fields. So uh, for me, it was a great experience. I wouldn't wouldn't trade it for anything. So you finished your PhD in uh, Syracuse University in the States, but then from what I see on your CV, you've been all over. You've been to 
uh, Mauritius, you've been to Canada, you've been to Germany, and then you came to Switzerland. Could you tell a little bit uh, how did your career develop from the moment that you were finishing your PhD? And uh, slowly let's progress to your uh, current job now as professor at uh, the Lucerne University of Applied Sciences and Arts. Sure. Um, and maybe it makes sense to start by having a look back from where I am today. So, so as you correctly stated, I'm in, I'm in Lucerne now. Um, beautiful city. It, it is a beautiful city. It's a lovely day here today. And um, no, there's the lake and the mountains. So it's a, it's a good place to be. But um, the Lucerne University of Applied Sciences and Arts is, you know, a larger university. And within this university system, I'm in the, the School of Business. And if you had asked me 10 years ago, you know, Martin, will you end up being a professor at a business school? I probably would have said, uh, no, that's not something I necessarily want, nor anything I can imagine. You know, so my, my path here has been quite nonlinear. And uh, and that's great. I've I've enjoyed every step of it, and I'm quite happy with where I am now. But all that to say, you know, looking back at when I finished my PhD, uh, it's not as if I followed some grand design, some path I'd sketched out to arrive at uh, the position I have today. It was a lot of circumstance, a lot of luck, um, some, you know. I don't know, just just fate that intervened in 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 certain ways. So this is why we are here today to discuss yeah. exactly <laughs> those things that I personally find interesting. Now, having spoken to eleven people before you, I discovered that actually every path is rather different, but there is a big difference between different people. Some of them really have a path in mind that they try to follow and invest a lot in advance to prepare themselves for the different uh, opportunities that may arise. Others don't. Yeah, yeah. I think um, it's interesting. And I, th I think what's also interesting is, is, and that's why I actually appreciate your your podcast quite a bit, is that these details of, of our individual stories don't necessarily become evident just from looking at the CV. Um, you know, you can you can read into somebody's uh you know steps in their career either some some grand plan and a very deliberate execution uh, but it might also be that it was a lot of circumstance and and luck or bad luck that that shaped it and i think that's where you have to get into conversation with people to understand why and how they ended up where they are and in my case um again it was a lot of lot of circumstance that that um led me to where i'm now yeah so in in um, my my wife and I were living in Berlin the year that I finished my dissertation. We had both had fellowships to uh, finish up our dissertations there. And my plan, is, in as far as I I had one, had always been to teach at a liberal arts college because I always liked the teaching bit more than the research and writing bit, and that's still true. I I enjoy writing uh, I enjoy researching but uh, I'm in this game for for the teaching you know that's that's where I get the most meaning out of it uh, so that was kind of the plan but we were starting a family at the time and it turned out there were a lot of things we really liked about living in Europe that uh, were not available in the US and it, you know the Europe especially kind of Germany and Scandinavia certainly as well. Uh, Switzerland also has a lot of family-friendly infrastructure, let's say, and family-friendly services uh, in terms of kindergartens, in terms of playgrounds and bike paths, all these things that don't really matter to you before you have kids, but then suddenly they become absolutely central to your life. And uh, so I was a bit at this this impasse where I'd always imagined myself teaching at a liberal arts college, um, but we made a decision we wanted to stay in Europe. So what to do? Um, and find your own college. <laughs> find, I, your own, find your own uh, liberal art college. Why not? Yeah, sure. Um, 
maybe maybe that's something uh, something um, I should have uh, do. I don't I don't think I'm the right person for that though. If, if, you know, being the founder of an institution requires uh, a lot of vision and stamina that I think I'm 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 lacking. But um, you know, I I did um, I did look for let's say more more alternative. Um, universities or, or institutions of higher education in Europe. There are some, I wouldn't call them liberal arts colleges, but you know, colleges that go in that direction. In, in the Netherlands, um, you know, there are a few, they're associated with the big universities, but there are these kind of smaller colleges that are a bit more interdisciplinary. Uh, there's one in Germany as well, in Freiburg, the University College Freiburg. And uh, so I did look at some of those, but wasn't able to get a, get a job at any of them. And um, I, like, like so many other people, I had to mix some um, kind of short-term work. I got some short-term fellowships. Um, I did some lecturing at, incidentally, at the university here in Lucerne. This was long before I then came back again to uh, have a full-time faculty role here. And I was able to piece that together along with some high school teaching to kind of pay, pay the bills until I got a, uh, a Marie Curie, this is a, a postdoc fellowship through the European Commission. And uh, that took us to Freiburg, Germany for two years, I was at the university there. And already at that point, I, I was very happy to have this, this postdoc, but already at that point I was deliberating whether or not to leave academia and do something else just seemed, you know, I was working really hard for very small rewards and the, the um, chances of landing kind of a full-time job with a decent salary um, seemed, seemed rather small. And so even before I got the postdoc, I had enrolled in a, um, an MBA program, so a part-time MBA program, because I thought, you know, maybe I just need to leave academia behind altogether, transition into, into industry, or I was, I was very interested in a lot of nonprofits that worked in education, et cetera. So I thought I need, I need some kind of additional training uh, to be able to, to make that, that, um, that step out of academia. And uh, so I finished that in, in 2016. I did that kind of on the side with my, my postdoc work. And then I did apply for some non-academic jobs, had some really interesting interviews, had, had some opportunities that I thought hard about um, taking, but I also got a job at ETH Zurich. And this is where these, these quirks or this, uh, you know, just, just circumstance occasionally lines up in your favor. This was a 50% faculty position and 50% um, management of a new institute that they were building up for um, for um, for the public sector. So it was a, an institute that would do research, but also offer continuing education for public sector professionals. And so what they were looking for is somebody who was an academic, had a PhD, had teaching and research experience, but also had kind of management credentials. And so there for the first time in my my career, I was, you know, the perfect candidate because I had the PhD and the academic experience, but also had an MBA. And um, so I ended up spending four years at ETH Zurich. This is a big research university in, in Switzerland, uh, both teaching and uh, setting up and then running this, this institute on public governance. And uh, that was great, great experience. Uh, also challenging uh, you know, as it is in many larger organizations, when you're trying to build something new, you um, um, can run into, um, you know, there's a lot of administrative um, wrangling that's involved. And after four years, I felt like I had, I had been there long enough, seen enough, and I was keen to try for a just traditional full-time academic position. There was an opening here in Lucerne. I applied, got it, and uh, I've been here since. That was uh, three years ago that I made the move. Well, that's quite impressive because a lot of people have difficulty transitioning back into academia from a non-academic job. 
even if they work within the university. And I know quite a few examples of people who transitioned from academia into administration, continued doing some academic work and actually still maybe do, do some academic work, but uh, never managed to get back. So congratulations on achieving it. I think it's very impressive that you managed. And uh, now perhaps it's a point to talk a little bit about the difference between uh, Etihad Zurich and uh, this uh, University of Applied Sciences that you are in at the moment. Could you explain a little bit for our listeners what's the difference between a traditional university and the uh, Hochschule, as the Germans call it, or the University of Applied Sciences that exists in many countries, in Germany, in Switzerland, in uh, Norway, in uh, Denmark, I guess in Sweden too? Uh, probably. I, ac I actually don't don't know how the Swiss system lines up uh, with with the Swedish or doesn't. So that's something maybe I need to research after this uh, after this podcast. Um, yeah, so in Switzerland, in the Swiss higher education landscape, there are the I think the first distinction is between the um, state uh, accredited, universities so the state funded and kind of state run universities and the the um the non i wouldn't say non accredited but the non state affiliated universities so there are there are private institutes of higher education they're often not allowed to use the label university but they call themselves institutes instead and there's a whole range uh, i've also worked at, at one of these and that's why i'm familiar with with those as well that was one of the places where I was, um, you know, teaching to kind of stay above water after my my PhD at a small. This was also a business school, um, but American not... University of Switzerland. Correct. Yes, exactly. Um, and um, but as I said, there's a whole range of of those that primarily cater to uh, international students, and some of them are excellent. So IMD, for example, which is globally one of the best business schools you know they they educate some of the top ceos from around the world it's an excellent institution it is private it's not um you know affiliated with with the swiss government or the or the canton um and uh then there are the you know, state run the public universities and there there are three um i wouldn't say tiers but three categories there are two federal universities, that's ETH and EPFL. Uh, technically, they're one legal entity, but they have two campuses, one in Zurich, ETH Zurich, and the other in Lausanne um, in south um, western Switzerland, uh, EPFL. And they are very, very research focused on kind of core research, you know, in physics, engineering. Um, have very generous funding from from the Swiss government and therefore also produce brilliant scientists, a lot, a lot of publication output. Um, and then you have the cantonal universities. So the cantons are the, the provinces or the states uh, within Switzerland, within the federal structure. And not every canton has university, but uh, there are a couple of such cantonal universities in the bigger areas of Basel, Zurich, St. Gallen, Geneva. Uh, Geneva. yeah, exactly. Bern. So I think there's there's seven or eight of those. We'd have to look that up to be to be sure. And additionally, there are uh, what in German is called Fachhochschulen in English, Universities of Applied Sciences and Arts, uh, which, as the name implies, are more applied in nature. So some of the teaching areas are the same as the cantonal universities they also have business schools they also teach um you know certain health sciences and engineering at the universities of applied sciences the emphasis is is more on the practical on you know really being in close touch with with uh with industry and and the needs that they have um and that of course was uh was new to me um with my background as a as a historian if i think if i think back to when i got my phd you know we never really discussed let's say 
practical problems. It's it's all very abstract, very very important problems. I would say I'd say some of the most important problems uh, that we as as um, you know humans should be discussing. But nonetheless, they're not you know about solving uh, some urgent need that uh, the city of Lucerne has today in order to ensure you know a smooth functioning public transportation system or something like that. And at a at a university of applied science, it's it's very much about being in touch with and teaching and researching these applied topics. Also, when it connects to history. Yeah, I would say so. And maybe that's my my contribution here. Um, th this is also where, for me, a, a comparison to the US is a bit instructive. I think at business schools in the US, it's not unusual to have a bunch of historians uh, on the faculty. I think in in the US, that's quite simply seen as, you know, as a perspective that future managers should learn to take. Whether it's, uh, you know, business history, uh, you know, studying the history of how industry has evolved, et cetera, or environmental history or the history of social movements, these are all you know, important inputs for um, aspiring managers to have. That's not so much the case in Europe, or certainly not in Switzerland. Uh, so I'm a bit of an oddity as a historian uh, here. Uh, and I think the fact that I have, since my PhD working at ETH, uh, it, with kind of public sector questions at the forefront, um, that definitely helped me become more sensitized to the types of topics that are uh, most urgent for aspiring managers and, and how to teach them. But I still bring my history perspective in every, every time I teach and every time I, I, you know, take up a research project. So are you now researching history? Uh, yes, yes, I am. Uh, so I have a couple of different research projects that are ongoing. Um, I'm involved in a large research group with researchers from a few different Swiss universities that aims to understand how cooperatives um, can help tackle some of the emerging challenges of global society in terms of climate change, uh, poverty, um, the strong erosion of democracy that we see in some places and uh so you know that that research project has many different dimensions and the the strand that i'm responsible for is kind of the historical lens you know essentially asking how how have cooperatives um responded to disruptive times in history in the past whether it was um, the industrial revolution where most cooperatives were born, but then the the two world wars, for example, um, it can be quite instructive uh, to look at how cooperatives evolved and responded to those uh, disruptive times and try to um, draw some parallels to the situation we're facing today. If I'm thinking about your career, I think that uh, something becomes very clear, at least to me as a listener, is that uh, you were not putting all the balls into one basket, so to say. You were, in a way, a historian that was interested in history, interested in historical research, but at the same time, you were also considering probably early on other opportunities because you did uh, do this uh, additional degree in, in uh, management MBA, which eventually was the one that led you into the semi-academic to my administrative job. Do you think that it's something that uh, would be advisable to everyone who is doing history? <laughs> to think about it early on, not uh, think about it at the stage when you're already done with your PhD, but maybe even uh, at the stage of finishing the bachelor degree, even if you're considering to perhaps at some point become a professional historian, to think about plan B already at that early stage. Or you think that one should follow his or her passions and uh, go with the flow. Yeah, it's a really good question. And I, I appreciate this observation you made about my career because 
that's not something I have thought about too much myself, but I think you're actually right that um, I did put my eggs in, in multiple baskets, so to speak. And I think even within history, you know, even within my, my work as a, let's say, traditional historian, I've never stayed focused on one topic too long. And I suspect that, or I know that this is not a, a deliberate choice to kind of diversify, but I think it just comes from my personality of having lots of different interests and, and very quickly becoming curious about new things. So I was never very good at specializing. You know, I did my my PhD work, and then my first book was on uh, the SS within the, the Nazi regime. I've since done a big project on the Sustainable Development Goals and, and the historical background to those. Uh, now I have this cooperative things. I'm publishing a book in the spring on leadership, again, through a historical lens. And it's not, it's not as if I ever told myself I need to be really diverse. I need to jump from subject to subject. That's just kind of how things played out for me. And I see it both as, as a strength and as a real deficit, I would say. Because, and, and therefore, you know, is this good advice or not? I don't really know. Uh, because I, I see both sides of this. I think the advantage to being specialized, and I see this in some of my colleagues who are specialized in, you know, very, very specific topics within, within business some of my colleagues here at the business school, but also uh, colleagues who have stayed uh, within you know, the field of history who are also very, very specialized. Um, then you at some point kind of become the guy or the woman on questions around this subject. You know, if you are the global expert on, I don't know, you know uh, let's say the evolving trade relationship between Namibia and and South Africa, then if there is a question about that in the world today, then they will come to you. Uh, on the other hand, you know, you should be hopeful that this question is ever going to arise. Sure, sure. Uh, and maybe that's a, a bad example. But you know what I mean? If people have they have the specialization, um, nobody in the world knows more about that than they do. Um, I think a lot there's a lot of satisfaction in that. And that's not necessarily something I have. And there's also, uh, you know, you become quite relevant when um, your specialization then uh, happens to be newsworthy or important in for business or society. Uh, but the downside, of course, is you're, you're a bit less adaptable. Uh, so, you know, again, I don't know what I would recommend. I think it depends a bit on your personality too. For me, this, this diversification has not only paid off, but it's meant that I've had a really fun career where I get to learn new things uh, all the time. So what is in 10 years from now? What What is the plan or the lack of it? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, I, I have a permanent job now and, and I'm very happy with it. I, I really love teaching here. I like the students. I like my colleagues. So as far as I can plan, I, I think in 10 years, I will still be uh, right here at the same school in Lucerne. In terms of um, research topics, uh, yeah, who, who, who knows? Um, I, I do think, you know, I've touched on a lot of different topics the last couple of years, and I do have some follow-up projects on, on the side of sustainability. Um, I still have some questions there that I'd like to follow up on. and. Um, you know, it always depends on funding and and finding the right collaboration partners. But um, I would like to look into a few questions uh, there before I leave that topic behind altogether. So we'll see. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. And uh, I think that our listeners will learn a lot from your example. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope so. And thanks for taking the time. <laughs>